Well, good afternoon uh, to you all. Welcome to an FTB webinar briefing on Don't Know What You've Got Till It's Gone, Planning and the Heritage Asset. Uh, my name is uh, Suzanne Ornsby and I will be chairing this event. We've got a great lineup for you uh, today. Firstly, we're going to hear from Andrew Fraser Urquhart, Queen's Council, who's going to consider what constitutes a listed building following the very recent Supreme Court case of Dill. Then we're going to hear from Craig Hal Williams, Queen's Council, who is going to explain to you what constitutes a curtilage following the recent High Court decision in Hampshire County Council relating to Blackbush Airport. And then uh, lastly, but by no means least, we're going to hear from Melissa Murphy, who is going to address the vexed issue of enforcement, including discussing <laughs> the Tower Hamlet's case and the use of the proceeds of Crime Act, otherwise known as POCA. We hope that this is not going to take any longer than about an hour. Each presentation is going to be around 15 minutes. We hope that there will be some time for um, a Q&A session at the end. But if we don't have time to uh, consider all your questions and you need further help, then please don't hesitate to get in touch with us in the normal way. But before I hand over to Andrew, I'd just like to say a little bit uh, about him by way of introduction. Uh, Andrew is uh, recognized as a leading silk in Chambers and Partners and is a council of choice um, as recognized in Planning Magazine. He has a wide ranging practice in infrastructure, housing, CPO and local plans with a particular emphasis on heritage. And uh, some of you may know that he was involved in the Arndale Properties case, which concerned the quashing of a conservation area designation for an improper purpose in order to thwart development. So with no more ado, I'm going to hand over to Andrew. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you, Suzanne. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let's just um, get the uh, slides on the screen for you. Here we are. Um, now I start, I'm afraid, with a uh, in deference to um, my uh, mother, um, a terrible joke, uh, which she is uh, a specialist at. What's a Grecian urn? About ten quid a week. Uh, the reason for referring to that, and I appreciate there's no canned laughter track on a webinar, which is a shame. Um, but the reason for this is this case deal is all about. Uh, a series of not Grecian, sadly, but uh, Dutch or Dutch sculpted urns, sculpted by a man called Johan van Nost in the uh, early 18th century. And then on the picture, there is an example of van Nost's work, not the urns that we're concerned with in this case. Um, I couldn't find, unfortunately, any photographs of those, but that's an example of van Nost's work. So draw from that what you will. Um, and this has led to a, a, an interesting piece of litigation which has arrived at the Supreme Court, which marks it out already as relatively uh, unusual for planning and heritage matters. Uh, and it gives us some interesting new insights into both procedure and substance with respect to the meaning of building in the context of listed building uh, enforcement procedures. So the facts of this case were, were as follows. There were two uh, 18th century uh, lead urns by the Flemish sculptor Johan van Nost. Um, and each was a, uh, a fairly substantial lead structure and it rested by gravity on a limestone plinth, which in turn rested uh, upon a concrete base. And that matter of resting by gravity, as we'll see, is of some importance. Now they began life as part of Rest Park uh, in Bedfordshire, which was the seat of the first Duke of Kent, as the way of these matters being, he's the Duke of Kent, but his seat was in Bedfordshire. And in 1725, these urns were uh, 
um, a quite important part by according to the literature of the um, approaches to the the manor house at rest park and they were for that reason uh, undoubtedly of of artistic value now uh, they were removed from rest park in 1939 and through a series of uh, inheritances and sales which we don't need to trouble ourselves with they ended up at a place called idlicote house which was inherited uh, by uh, mr dill from his father who was was a major dill apparently um, and that there is uh, idlicote house and the urns uh, were placed on the driveway uh, on their limestone plinths on their concrete bases all resting by their own weight with no uh, form of attachment and they urns were then sold at auction in 2009 and they were removed overseas and that's quite important in terms of the uh, procedural history of this matter um, because Indicote House itself had been listed in 1966 and then in 1986 it was grade two listed and then in 1986 the items and that's the phrase that lord carnworth in the supreme court and in fact all the judges considering this used to describe the urns and their bases they were called the items and that's generally the uh, terminology i'll adopt in this talk and they were added to the list in 1986 the Relevant authorities couldn't find the listing decision or any paperwork relating to the decision to make that listing of the items in 1986. And they couldn't find any criteria by which it had been determined that they were uh, to be regarded as a listed building, uh, despite clearly not being a building in the ordinary common sense meaning of that term. What was pertinent was that no notice of the listing of the items, the urns, was ever sent to the owner. And also when the um, sale was uh, in progress, English Heritage were actually sent notice of the sale in advance. They weren't sent this in a formal way as part of the legal process. They were simply sent the auction brochure on the basis that a that they English heritage might be prospective buyers um, for uh, the, uh, the items and in fact the items uh, I mean English heritage showed no interest didn't respond said nothing about anything at the time the items were duly sold they were sold for 55,000 pounds so they were no, no small beer um, and they were say were removed overseas now the details of the items were of course of some importance in this case as i said they consisted of um, the piers upon which the urn sat consisted of limestone pedestals in a slab nature so i think they were effectively four sides around a, a hollow core rather than a solid construction and they then rested on concrete slabs which were on the ground and the urns in their turn the lead urns sat on the those those pedestals the piers without any attachment at all simply resting by weight of gravity and when they came to be removed following the sale um, they were simply lifted in three pieces the urns and the top of the pier um, were lifted together the remaining part of each pier was then lifted and then the concrete base was lifted and they were all lifted by one of those low loader lorries which had its had a, has a little crane on the back um, and just to complete the factual ba background when they were in situ they were together about 247 centimeters high so 2.4 meters is about what, 15 feet so uh, of some size but 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 not enormous now um in 2015 so more than six years after the sale and the first that mr dill had ever heard of this matter of them being listed buildings the local planning authority wrote to mr dill saying that they were listed buildings they'd heard that they'd been uh, removed and therefore that retrospective listed building consent would be required and mr dill applied for that presumably somewhat bemusedly at the course of events but he applied for that and listed building consent was refused 
and a listed building enforcement notice was issued. Um, appeal proceedings began and the appeal was dismissed. And where the case starts to become interesting is that the inspector concluded that the state that the status of the items as listed buildings had been settled by the fact of the listing and it could not be considered afresh by him and so all of the evidence that Mr Dill had wanted to bring about the history of the items the, the nature of the items the way in which they were uh, resting on the land by their own weight and so forth none of those things were regarded as relevant by the inspector he didn't consider them and therefore uh, simply faced with a situation where these were listed buildings which had been removed uh, as matters stood at that time he dismissed the appeal uh, Mr Dill appealed to the High Court and then on to the Court of Appeal and both courts upheld um, the view that uh, the matter of the status of the items as listed buildings had been definitively settled by the fact of their listing effectively the logic being that the statutory grounds of appeal did not include um, a uh, an ability to argue that the things involved were not buildings uh, and that was simply to be taken as read by the fact of the listing uh, and obviously at the time there would have been had mr dill known of matters a right to bring judicial proceedings um, but that would have been on the normal public law tests rather than necessarily on on merits issues and of course then the matter proceeds to the Supreme Court. Now the Supreme Court uh, was presented with two agreed issues but in, in reality sort of decided and gave guidance on three issues. The first was the procedural but the important procedural issue of whether or not the inspector could consider the issue of whether the um, items, the urns, were in fact buildings at all and therefore, if they're not buildings, they can't be listed buildings. And, and then if that was correct, if the inspector was able to consider that matter at the appellate stage, what were the criteria he was uh, to apply in coming to that decision? But it also considered, and this is why I say they decided three issues, although this wasn't explicitly identified for them as an issue. They considered what Lord Carmouth called the extended definition of listed building um, in section 15 of the 1990 Act, which I'll come to in just a moment. Um, and that's the, the legislative framework. And so um, a listed building is a building included in a list. Now, both parts of that, as we'll see, are important. So a building included in a list. That's the, as it were, standard or narrow definition. And then what Lord Carnworth called the extended definite definition which is an object or structure fixed to the building or within the curtilage of the building which formed part of the land and has done so since before the 1st July 1948 and it's important just to note here that this is not um, just a matter of being within the curtilage of a listed building it's actually part of the definition of the listed building itself um, the, uh, with respect to the matter of um, a building itself, the definition of building itself, there is, as you'll know, no definition of that within the Listed Buildings Act, and instead the definition springs from the Town and Country Planning Act, so therefore a building includes any structure or erection and any part of a building as so defined, but does not include plant or machinery comprised in a building. So again, a fairly well-known and standard definition, but taking for, taken from the main planning act. Um, then of course, the, the, the remaining parts of the uh, legislative framework are, uh, I'm sure, well known to you. So there is the provision for listed building consent applications and appeals. The appeals, one of the grounds on appeal is a, is a claim that the building is not of special interest, but pause to note there, it does not say that it's not a building. The fact that it's a building not of special interest presupposes within that statutory definition that it, it is a building. Uh, then of course we have the enforcement notice and appeals process for listed buildings. Again, an enforcement notice appeal may include 
the claim that a building is not a special interest, but as I've said, that doesn't mean, on the statutory wording, that doesn't mean uh, a claim that the uh, thing is not, a, is not a building at all. And then, of course, the Secretary of State may remove a building from the list if he concludes after the appellate process that it's not worthy of protection. But again, that's a different matter from the consideration ab initio of whether it is a building at all. So the first issue then is decided in deal. Can the status as a listed building be raised? Well, Lord Carnworth said that he was able to deal with that relatively shortly, which I suspect is judicial code for what on earth are the lower courts doing. Uh, perhaps slightly unfairly, but that seems to be the way he regarded it. Um, and the matter he said was, was squarely based upon the individual's fair opportunity to challenge legal measures taken against them, uh, relying on the, uh, I mean, it's a fairly obvious principle anyway, but enshrined in, 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 in case law, most uh, notably in the Boddington case in the House of Lords in 1999. Now, um, that was regarded as an overriding principle. The Secretary of State argued that the ability to judicially review the listing decision at the time it's made was sufficient protection. And in support of that argument, the, the Secretary of State relied upon the case of Wicks in again, another House Lords case, 1998, which held that with respect to a planning enforcement notice within that context, when you looked at the range of matters that could be raised, the uh, statutory scheme had to be considered. And similarly, in this case, it was argued by the Secretary of State, the statutory scheme, which provided certain grounds of appeal, meant that you had to regard the ability to, to do judicial review of the decision to list a building as what Parliament had intended to be the appropriate protection with respect to that matter. That was the way it was put by the Secretary of State. However, Lorne Carnworth didn't didn't have any of that. Um, he said, in effect, that um, because Wicks had been placed based on a planning enforcement notice, and because in Wicks it explicitly said that the statutory grounds of appeal, quote, are so wide that they include every aspect of the merits of the decision to serve, because of, uh, of that, um, that was such a wide definition that it, it in effect, it, it helped the uh, argument of Mr. Dill rather than the Secretary of State, because what um, what Wicks was saying was that there, the only limitation that there is uh, in dealing with a planning enforcement notice is with respect to the matter of judicially reviewing the expediency of issuing the notice. And that's a tiny residual matter. And with respect to listed buildings, you've got a much more, in a sense, restrictive statutory regime, which doesn't allow you on the face of it to raise the matter of whether or not the items were a building at all. Now, because the Wix protection was meant to be so wide, the courts had intended that there be a wide protection and a wide ability to raise matters uh, in, in defense of your position, effectively, when you were faced with legal measures. The court, the court said, Carnworth said, that that actually helped Mr. Dill and the fact that there wasn't clear statutory wording um, meant that the, uh, in, in this Building Act's grounds of appeal, meant that the principle in Wix that you could have you had a wide range of appeal that could include every aspect of the, the merits of the decision. That meant, that gave support to the notion that you should uh, be an, an entitled to raise this fundamental matter of whether or not the thing was a building at all. And similarly, he drew attention to the fact that a, the definition of listed building, the statutory dis, uh, definition of listed building includes two matters. First of all, the inclusion on the list, but also the fact of being a building. And he thought it was nonsensical to say that you couldn't challenge a fundamental limb of the statutory definition when you're defending yourself from proceedings, from, from legal measures based upon that definition. And so he said in the absence of uh, an explicit statutory exclusion, which there wasn't one, there was no reason not to be able to argue that it wasn't a building. So the appeal was allowed on that first issue. So therefore you can raise the fundamental issue, is it a building? 
Foursquare within a listed building enforcement um, appeal or, or listed building notice appeal. Um, then he moved on to talk about the extended definition. He spent quite some time in the judgment referring to the uh, wide range of items which might be listed uh, contained within this, this extended definition. And in particular, he referred to the specific guidance note which Historic England had produced on garden and park structures. But he also noticed that both that and other guidance that was uh, abroad uh, was not very clear as to the criteria for the decision to conclude that something was to be considered as a building and that there was a, a, an inaccurate um, conflation often of the extended definition and the definition of curtilage uh, listed buildings and that where you had to focus specifically on the issue of whether something was a listed building there was, a, there was a dearth of clear guidance. And looking at the extended definition, he, he made the important point that the extended definition um, doesn't result in the object becoming a building in its own right. It's simply treated as part of the building to which it's attached or in whose curtilage it stands. That distinction, as I said, was blurred in official publications. Now, when you look at this matter of affixment for the purposes of being um, part of the curtilage extended definition, um, the, the authorities based on the law of real property concerning fixtures to the land became relevant and reviewing, reviewing those authorities, um, Carnworth noted that some non-attached objects could in fact be considered to be fixed if they're an essential part of the design of the house and grounds. And so particularly referred to a case called Barclay, um, where the matters in issue, in issue were a statue and sundial in the gardens and pointed at the tests of the method of de and degree of annexation, which is fairly obvious, is it fixed the land and the object and purpose of the annexation. So, for example, where um, the, in, in the Barclay case, the statue had been as a central point of the design of the garden. They, the design of the garden, the grounds had all been based around this statue. And therefore, in that context, although it wasn't physically attached to the land, it was still regarded as sufficiently an important part of the piece of real property that it was taken to be fixed for the land and therefore within the extended definition. Now, in this case, in the Dill case, it's the complete opposite. The statues were that the urns are actually brought in from somewhere else. They'd lived for most of their life at uh, Rest Park and had only been brought to, to this land in the, sometime in the 1950s. Therefore, they couldn't ever have been part of the central design of the house and garden. Therefore, given that they weren't fixed to the land either, they were certainly not within the extended definition. So then he came on finally to the proper test for whether or not this was to be regarded as a building. And he effectively adopted the Skerritt's test, the normal test in planning law as to whether something is um, a building. He went through the authorities looking at the, uh, the Cardiff case, which is a rating case, which was started this whole uh, matter of, uh, of how you define a building. As again, you'll know the case of Barvis, which was a mobile crane on a small piece of railway line, was held to be a building. And the Skerritt's case, which was a marquee erected for the season in the hotel grounds, also found to be a building and Carnworth concluded that there was no reason not to use the Skerritt's test for whether an object is a building. And so just really to recap on where, where we stand with the Skerritt's threefold test. First of all, the issue is of size um, and that allows some particular reference to whether or not the item, the thing would ordinarily be brought to the site in an assembled form which militates against it being a building, uh, or whether it's so big that it would be uh, brought in in component parts and assembled on the land. For example, the crane in Barvis was, was assembled on the land. Um, and so therefore that's one of the factors, but not, not, not all which goes into the, the consideration of the issues of size. Again, the degree of permanence um, in Skerritt, a uh, five month summer season out of the year was enough for it to be permanent enough to be a building. 
Uh, similarly, in, in Barvis, where a crane was brought on for the duration of a contract, which wasn't actually certain, uh, then again, that was regarded as being sufficiently uh, permanent to be a building. And then the degree of physical attachment, obviously, the greater that is, then the more likely it is to be a building. Um, and spikes in the ground to hold down the marquee were sufficient as part of the overall factual matrix to, for it to be concluded that that was a building. Um, there's some degree of movement uh, permitted, i.e. The, the mobile crane in Bar and Barvis moved up and down its little piece of railway line, temporary railway line, and so even though it moved a bit, obviously the crane had moved, it was still, still regarded as permanent enough in combination with its size and degree of attachment to constitute a, a building for the purposes of planning and now for the purposes of, of listed building considerations. And finally, there's reference, particularly in Barvis, to policy objectives. And when looking at matters such as size and permanence, that obviously relates to a matter of, of, of impact on amenity. And uh, it's not the purpose of the legislation that large things on the land should escape by, by sort of technicalities in some ways uh, from being considered as buildings and thus within the control of um, local planning authorities and the scope of planning law. So that's the, the threefold test endorsed by Carnworth. That's the heart of now of what one has to look at when considering whether something is a building for listed building purposes. Um, just in this case, it was poor old Mr. Dill having had five years of litigation to find out whether these wretched things were buildings or not. And having won this appeal, the matter was nevertheless remitted for, for rehearing. Or Karma very sympathetic with Mr. Dill's position, but did point out that there were factors pulling in both directions uh, in this particular case, but he wasn't going to decide it. But there was a strong suggestion, given that the things had been gone for six years overseas, very difficult to get them back. It's a strong suggestion from Lord Carmworth that it wasn't expedient in all the circumstances to pursue this case. So just some briefly, some 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 takeaways. I I rather cheekily wonder whether this is a, a hard cases make bad law sort of case. Clearly the merits, given the way the local planning authority had behaved, the lack of notification of the listing uh, when it was actually done, um, generates quite a sympathy for Mr. Dill's position. But the, the way in which Lord Carmworth, um, to an extent really, perhaps tramples is a bit strong, but certainly um, does some pretty serious judicial lawmaking in terms of the appropriate uh, grounds of appeal when there, there just isn't really support for the, the approach taken in the words of the statute. That's quite a wide ranging change in my opinion. And um, clearly that's going to be an approach that's adopted or, or at least argued for, whether it will be adopted is another matter, but certainly argued for in other circumstances. Is it going to lead this, this formulation of at essential fairness? Is it going to lead to a broadening of matters in other contexts, not just in the list of building context, but in other contexts where matters want to be raised which are not strictly within grounds of appeal? We'll see. Um, again, I'm saying rather cheekily perhaps, hard cases, bad law. Um, clearly this was a, a pretty egregious case in many ways in terms of Mr Dill's position whether it represents bad law to say that you should fairly be able to raise all matters, well, that's a, a matter of opinion, but it will be interesting to see how it sits in circumstances where there are uh, statutory grounds of appeal and so forth. Um, there was a strong note in the, in the judgment, it runs really right through the whole uh, test of it, um, about heritage authorities clarifying guidance and criteria on this matter. Um, and now with very clear guidance on the principle to apply the Skerritt's threefold test and uh, a clear recognition that it's a very fact-based exercise. One point just to, to speculate on that is that the, the line of authority that um, Skerritt's derives from, and in particular the, the Barvis case, uh, does include suggestions that policy considerations may come into this. Now is that going to uh, persuade authorities, heritage authorities, that if something is worthy of a protection, that the definition of building might be stretched a bit in order to bring it within the list of buildings legislation. And would the courts find that acceptable, given the policy um, 
strain or thread that there undoubtedly is in the Cardiff, uh, Barvis, Skerritt's authorities. We'll, we'll have to see. Um, but it's a, an interesting case. It clarifies procedurally one thing, I think, and uh, puts the matter very much as a fact-based exercise based on criteria which now we know they apply to this buildings we're all pretty familiar with. So that's the deal case for you. Um, Suzanne, I'll pass back and contribute to questions in due course. Right, well, thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you for that very detailed and clear analysis of Lord Carnworth's judgment in the deal case. Um, we have got one question from um, Monica Ford, but if you don't mind, Monica, I'm just going to put that to the Q&A session at, um, at the end. So um, before we turn to um, Craig Howe-Williams, who's going to tell us all about what constitutes a curtilage, I'm just going to say a few words about Craig. Um, as you know, Craig has a very well-earned reputation as a leading silk in the field of planning law and has extensive um, experience in dealing with heritage issues. In particular, he's been instructed in relation to the proposal for a radar tower um, in close proximity to a listed lighthouse. He's been instructed on enforcement notice and planning appeals concerning development near Hampton Court. He's concerned with a large um, mosque proposal in a conservation area in Camberley and also engaged in relation to proposed alterations to a grade two starred building in Savile Row. No doubt that's where you get your suits, Craig. He is currently awaiting a decision um, by the Secretary of State in relation to a tall building proposal in Woolwich, which affects the settings of Grade 1 listed Royal Brass Foundry, the Grade 2 starred listed barracks, <coughs> and the <Arsenal coughs> Conservation Area. So with no more ado, I will hand over to Craig. Thank you very much. Thanks, Susie, very much. Um, and I hope the slides are um, on your screen. Um, I'm going to talk about the case of Hampshire County Council. Um, and I'm going to be hoping to help on the uh, meaning or understanding of the word curtilage. Um, we all know from our experience that curtilage is um, an English word. Uh, but it's not simply an English word. The Oxford English Dictionary describes it, as I've said on the second bullet point, as a small court, a yard, garth, or piece of ground attached to a dwelling house. But you'll note that the Oxford English Dictionary doesn't stop there. Within the definition itself, it refers to the fact that the term, the word is mostly a legal or formal term nowadays. And so one would expect um, there to be a simple answer for the question, what does it mean in the context of the law? Uh, sadly, that is far from the case. In the Skerritt's case to which Andrew referred, um, Robert Walker, Lord Justice uh, Robert Walker, as he was then, said that he respectfully doubted whether the expression curtilage can usefully be called a term of art. The phrase describes an expression which is used by persons skilled in some particular profession, art or science, and which the practitioners clearly understand, even if the uninitiated do not. So he said that the case he was uh, uh, dealing with demonstrated that not even lawyers can have a precise idea of what curtilage means, except that it means uh, it should be applied as a question of fact and degree. So it's with some trepidation that uh, I seek to, um, with reference to the Hampshire case, throw some light onto the question of the understanding of the word curtilage. The Hampshire case does not, in fact, um, relate to a listed building. <clears throat> but that doesn't mean to say it's not relevant. It is relevant because it considers the meaning of curtilage by reference to a number of statutory provisions and importantly 
the listed building act 1990. So Blackbush Airport, you can see there, it's quite a significant um, airport in terms of its uh, ge geographical size. It was originally a military airport. The military activity stopped, I think, after the Second World War. And um, at the moment, it accommodates several corporate jets, two flying schools, a helicopter training facility, and a num number of other associated um, activities. The current owners of the airport um, wish to enhance the range of activities at the airport, um, including a new terminal building. I think the current terminal building is that to the bottom left of the uh, picture, as I've shown it to you there, um, as well as new hangars. Uh, sadly for them, the redevelopment plans relate to the southeast of the airport, um, which is covered by Yateley Common. And the extent of Yateley Common being shown there <clears throat> in green, it's an extensive area of open heather, gorse, birch, and oak woodland. It includes a site of special scientific interest. Um, and visitors can walk around it. Um, it was registered as common land under the Commons Registration Act 1965. But as you can see from the area covered um, pink and yellow, it overlaps with the airport in a significant way. And notwithstanding that um, provisions of the Aviation Security Act 2018 prevent trespass on an aerodrome, um, development at the airfield um, is restricted by the Commons status of the land. And so an application <clears throat> to deregister the land uh, had to be made under paragraph six of Schedule Two of the Commons Act. The application land covered 115 acres. It's the area shown red on the picture there. That's 115 acres of operational land, including the terminal building to the bottom right hand side of the picture, a building that had a footprint uh, relatively small of 360 square meters. A public inquiry was held when Hampshire um, deferred the decision to the Secretary of State and the decision was issued and the inspector granted the application to deregister the airport and a judicial review was um, made to challenge the decision. So it's important to understand, indeed it's critical, to have a look at the precise wording of paragraph 6 of Schedule 2 to the Commons Act 2006 because that provides a provision whereby land, common land, has to be removed from the register if the authority is satisfied in a number of ways, including B, that on the date of the provisional registration the land was covered by a building or was within the curtilage of a building. And D, since the date of the provisional registration the land has at all times been and still is covered by a building or within the curtilage of a building. And as the uh, judge in this case, Mr. Justice Holgate, uh, noted, the statute establishes a challenging requirement for deregistration. For an application to succeed under paragraph six, it has to be shown that the land has been covered either by um, a building or fallen within the curtilage of a building continuously since the date of provisional registration, a period which might be in excess of 50 years. I turn to the inspector's decision. He recognized and acknowledged the curtilage as a matter of fact and degree. The inspector applied the three Stevenson factors from the Cold Place case, to which I'll return. Uh, but his conclusion is important and has to be read carefully. What he said was that taking all of those factors into account, he found that the operational area of the airport was 
and is associated with the terminal building to such an extent that the operational area was and is part and parcel with the building and an integral part of the same unit that it forms one enclosure with the building and serves the purposes of the building in some necessary or reasonably useful way. Now, so far as the arguments in court were concerned, Mr. Justice Holgate identified the central issue as follows, whether the inspector erred in law in deciding that the whole of the operational land of the airport fell within the curtilage of the building, namely the terminal building and at all material times. A number of arguments were deployed. Hampshire, the main challenge all, argued that the inspector had misunderstood the concept of ancillariness and had failed to apply what was said to be the largeness test from the Skerritts case. The Open Space Society argued for a strict approach based upon conveyancing law. The Secretary of State and the airport operators, Bow, argued for a neutral approach to interpretation and Bauer also argued this. They said that the inspector was correct in posing this question. Is the land and building associated in such a way that they comprise part and parcel of the same entity, a single unit or an integral whole? Mr. Justice Holgate first looked at the statutory framework considering the registration provisions for common land and making specific uh, comment upon uh, that legislation and the absence of rights to compensation. As a result of which he concluded that Parliament had in its uh, consideration of that statute and the um, whole of the legislation balanced the interests of landowners of common land with the interests of those with rights to use that common land. As a result of making that comment, uh, the judge decided that the argument deployed by the Open Space Society that Section 3 of the Human Rights Act requires a restrictive or narrow interpretation in order to accord with Article 1 of the First Protocol uh, should be rejected. Likewise, the argument that curtilage should be interpreted narrowly on the basis that legislation has a dispropriety effect was also rejected. But importantly, bearing in mind our focus for listed building legislation, Mr. Justice Holgate noted that the authorities, which he then sought to um, go through, state that the use of curtilage is sensitive to language used by Parliament, the context and purpose of the legislation. And so the wording in paragraph six, the curtilage of a building was of critical importance. So he then went to a number of uh, places in order to support his reasoning. First, he looked at landlord and tenant cases. All of this, they all, refer to the concept and word curtilage, the first being Methuen Campbell against Walters, a court of appeal case, relating to a lease, demising a dwelling together with a garden and a paddock. And it was held in that case that the paddock, a rough paddock, was not an appurtenance of the house <clears throat> and therefore not within the curtilage of it. Uh, in the course of that case, Lord Justice uh, Buckley <clears throat> said this, that for one corporeal hereditament to fall within the curtilage of another, the former must be so intimately associated with the latter as to lead to the conclusion that the former, in truth, forms part and parcel of the latter. Now, Mr. Justice Holgate said this in relation to that case. Lord Justice Buckley did not decide that an area of land is within the curtilage of a building if it is associated with a building 
in such a way that the land and building comprise part and parcel of the same entity, a single unit or an integral whole. Instead, he said, Mr. Justice Holgate, the issue is whether an area of land is so intimately associated with a building that that land forms part and parcel of the building. He said that would be consistent with the ordinary English meaning of curtilage and appurtenance as explained in the dictionaries. In other words, <clears throat> he said that the question that the inspector should have asked was whether the application land was so intimately associated with the terminal building as to form part and parcel of that building, not whether the application land and the terminal building together formed part and parcel of the same entity. He turned to the case of Dyer relating to uh, the Housing Act, giving local authority tenants a right to buy uh, their home, except in circumstances where the house lay within the curtilage of a building held mainly for non-residential purposes. And the Court of Appeal in that case held that um, the, the, the house didn't fall within the curtilage of any of the college's buildings and so was not excluded from the right to buy provisions. Lord Donaldson's uh, judgment, based on Lord Justice Buckley's judgment in Methuen Campbell, stated this, that an area of land cannot properly be described as a curtilage unless it forms part and parcel of the house or building which it contains or to which it is added. And so um, Mr. Justice Holgate um, found that case helpful in endorsing the approach set out by Lord Justice Buckley in the Methuen Campbell case. So now let's look to the listed building act 1990 which Mr. Justice Holgate turned. Here, the definition of a listed building is indeed a term of art within the legislation, and Andrew has spoken to its meaning by reference to the recent case of Dill. But it's important here to look at the extended definition to which Andrew made reference. What is a listed building is not simply a building included on the list of buildings of special architectural or historic interest. It has an extended meaning. The listed building will include, for the purposes of the Act, any object or structure fixed to a building or any object or structure within the curtilage of the building. Now, uh, that extended meaning lies at the root of Mr. Justice Holgate's distinction between the approach to curtilage in the Listed Building Act and the approach to curtilage in the landlord and tenant um, context to which he had made reference, Methuen Campbell and the case of Dyer. Um, in the Court of Appeal case of Calderdale, that was the case you will recall relating to a terrace of cottages attached to a mill over a bridge. Um, and it was held that um, uh, the terrace was part of the listed building because it was a structure fixed to it, or if it wasn't fixed to it, it was within its curtilage. Now, in passing, I note that the House of Lords in the Debenhams case was critical of the wide reasoning in the Calderdale case, and indeed said uh, that the decision was nonetheless correct on the basis that structures must be ancillary to the listed building in order to qualify under the limbs of A and B under Section 5. That's not to say that there's a legal requirement for land to be ancillary to a building in order to inform, to inform the curtilage. Um, ancillariness with respect to that question may be taken into account as a relevant factor. 
Um, now, when Calderdale was referred to by Mr. Justice Holgate, it's important to note that he um, gave his blessing, as it were, to Lord Justice Stevenson's three factors for the approach to take to the um, question of curtilage in a given case. First, the physical layout of the building and structure. Secondly, their ownership, past and present. And thirdly, their use and function, past and present. Uh, it's important also, of course, when examining the question of curtilage, to have regard to the question of um, relative size. A curtilage does not have to be small, but that doesn't mean that relative size between building and claimed curtilage land may not be a relevant consideration. That's the Skerritt's case. The curtilage doesn't have to be ancillary as a matter of law, but that doesn't mean that ancillariness to the building may not be a relevant consideration. But the important point that Mr. Justice Holgate took from the Calderdale um, uh, case uh, was that the statutory words are important, that the Act sought to protect objects and structures that were not actually part of the building, so closely related to it that, that they were worth preservation and protection. The statutory words are, of course, critical here. The listed building protects the building itself together with the objects and structures, even though they're not actually part of the building, but they are so closely related to it that they're worth preserving. That is a broad approach to interpretation being justified according to um, Mr. Justice Holgate relying on the Calderdale case. Um, one has to dig a little bit deeper to properly understand uh, Mr. Justice Holgate's um, interpretation of the uh, judgment of Lord Justice Stevenson in the Calderdale case. In the High Court, Mr. Justice Skinner had said this, I have to ask whether the buildings within the alleged curtilage form a single residential or industrial unit and whether the mill and the terrace form part of an, of an integral whole. So Mr. Justice Holgate said this, looking at Mr. Justice Skinner's uh, judgment and the question he posed and concluding that the Court of Appeal gave its blessing to that question. There's no disguising the fact that the single unit or integral whole approach of Mr. Justice Skinner for the purposes of listed building control, apparently endorsed on appeal, is very different from that of Lord Justice Buckley in the Methuen Campbell case and of the Court of Appeal in Dyer. The integral whole referred to by Lord Justice Buckley relating to land which was so intimately associated with the relevant building as to form part and parcel of the building, he did not suggest that the relevant question was that posed by Mr. Justice Skinner, namely whether the land and the building, or in Calderdale, the mill and the terrace, together formed part of an integral whole. Mr. Justice Holgate therefore concluded that the inspector had erred in applying the broad approach to the meaning of curtilage, which couldn't be justified by reference to the statute or case law. And as a result of that central overarching uh, error, other consequential errors in approach were made. He should have therefore focused on the size of the land relative to that of the terminal building rather than considering the purpose of the land and the terminal building together. He said that on the inspector's incorrect approach, the whole of a golf course could be said to fall within the curtilage of a clubhouse because the relative size of the open land used for the course and its setting is proportionate to the functions and purpose for which the, both the land and the building are used. That approach was inconsistent with 
style. And so uh, what do we take from the Hampshire uh, case and the understanding of curtilage? The first thing to take from this case is that the meaning and application of curtilage and the approach to it will depend on the words in the statute, the particular statute engaged and its context and purpose. Hampshire identified two broad approaches. First, the narrow one, whether the land is so intimately associated with the building that it forms part and parcel of the building. And the broad approach, whether the land is so closely related to the building as to constitute with it a single unit or an integral whole. The listed building act justifies the broad approach. In short, the integral whole approach. What is significant in particular here is that the broad approach was said not to be justified under planning legislation, in other words, the Town Country Planning Act, and in relation to permitted development rights. That legislation tended towards the narrow approach. Now, it may not surprise you, having heard what I've said and commented upon from this case, that permission was given to appeal to the Court of Appeal, indeed given by Mr. Justice Holgate. And there's no doubt in my mind that the Court of Appeal will have quite a lot to um, grapple with. The Court will no doubt have in mind the following. The first, that the Hampshire judgment depends upon a comparison of statutory wording that actually is similar in other words, land within the curtilage of a building in the Commons Act 2006, compared to an object or structure within the curtilage of the building in the Listed Building Act 1990. It will also have in mind that the Hampshire judgment depends upon the interpretation of two Court of Appeal cases, both of which use similar and arguably interchangeable words and phrases. In Methuen Campbell, the words so intimately associated, part and parcel, an integral whole, and in Calderdale, so closely related, integral whole, single unit. It will also have in mind, I'm sure, that the Calderdale case um, on which significant reliance is placed by Mr. Justice Holgate has already been the subject of some criticism by reference to the Debenhams House of Lords case. And it will also have in mind that it arrives at an arguably uncomfortable position in which there's a significant different approach for planning cases and listed building legislation, where one might argue for some alignment and that that might provide some practical awkwardness for practitioners in the field. So it is very much uh, watch this space, like a TV box set, the story uh, continues. Susie, thank you. Well, thank you um, very much, Craig, for that very uh, clear explanation of the very detailed exposition on curtilage by uh, Mr. Justice Holgate in that case. So finally, we're going to um, move on to um, Melissa. Um, Melissa is um, described in uh, Chambers and Partners as an excellent, tenacious, and um, very good barrister with clients. She has 18 years experience and um, her professional highlights in relation to heritage issues uh, relate to um, acting for the National Trust in relation to a Grade 1 Jacobean mansion and parkland, which is a long-running matter uh, due to go to the Court of Appeal later this year. 
and also together with Craig, uh, she is representing the London Borough of Hillingdon in a battle royale with the government over HS2 uh, concerning archaeological issues. Uh, she is also instructed, as many of you may know, um, by the Mayor of London, the GLA, on the West Ferry Printworks case, uh, which has been the subject of a recent consent order that you might have read about uh, in the press. But with no more ado, um, I'm going to hand you over now to Melissa. Melissa, thank you very much. Thank you, Suzanne. And welcome all of you to the third and final part of our Heritage webinar this afternoon. It falls to me to take up the baton um, at possibly the most soporific part of a warm June afternoon. And so I shall hope um, that if I do nothing else, I will keep you all awake and engaged. And I'm going to start by trying to, uh, well, hope that I'm not going to fail on a technological front. I'm going to share my um, PowerPoint with you. Oh, you're too kind. It is important to get over those first technological hurdles. As you can see, I'm dealing with um, enforcement. Um, my part uh, is has two separate um, aspects, two separate sections. As you can see, we're going to look at um, two cases first, Tower Hamlets and Spitfire, and then turn to the two prosecutions on the Proceeds of Crime Act, looking in particular at the Odawali uh, example, which is a recent case in the planning context. Development in conservation areas. It is necessary to appreciate at the outset, of course, when looking at development in conservation areas, that planning permission is required for demolition in a conservation area, as I've set out. And secondly, that it's an offence to carry out or cause or permit to be carried out relevant demolition without the required planning permission. Now, we are going to look at a Tara Hamlet's case, and as um, Suzanne mentioned to you, one has been in the news recently in relation to the Westbury Printworks, Tara Hamlet's, and of course the GLA, but we're not going to talk about that one. I know, I know, it is a disappointment, but on the other hand, we're going to talk about this one, which is an enforcement case and so therefore relevant to my subject area. <laughs> so important to get feedback in these webinars, um, I've felt. So on to Tower Hamlets. And the Tower Hamlets case was a decision uh, of the High Court in at the end of August, I think, of last year. So the end of the, at the end of last summer. And it involved three cottages on the Isle of Dogs. Um, the last remaining dwellings, as you can see from the slide, from the Victorian Workers' District of Cubitt Town. And that forms the eastern side uh, of the Isle of Dogs. And it was within a recently extended, actually, part of the Cold, Har Cold Harbour Conservation Area. Now, these three buildings were demolished without planning permission. There wasn't, in fact, a prosecution. Uh, as I understand it, there was a, a dispute in relation to ownership. The enforcement notices which were issued subsequently required rebuilding. They required, in fact, the provision of facsimile um, buildings. Ground A appeals were brought. Um, ground A, obviously, the um, planning permission should be granted for the development of the subject of the notice. Now, the inspector found that less than substantial harm arose from the demolition. It's, it was argued in support of the grant of planning permission that there were public benefits of the proposal. Now, bear in mind that bear in mind that the mind that the that the proposed demolition alone it was a retro, in effect a retrospective application for planning permission for the demolition. It was said that the benefits included a public benefit flowing from demolition i.e. the redevelopment of the site, although the only evidence was of a scheme called the Turner Scheme prepared by architects, and that was a suggestion of the kind of scheme that can and should come forward for that site. So a redevelopment which was a prospect only. On that basis, the appeal was allowed, the notices were quashed, 
and planning permission for demolition only was granted. You're right, madam, that does require a further look. Well, what, ha what was said in the decision letter, the inspector said that as there was no current planning application for replacement development, the benefits were speculative, but it was highly likely a suitable proposal could be found. There was a subsequent challenge. The court found that the inspector had been entitled to take into account likely future benefits, bearing in mind the particular circumstances of that case. Essentially, the prospect, prospect only, of, um, of re sorry, re redevelopment, not redetermination, redevelopment, was a material consideration. And the fact that it wasn't a certainty simply affected the weight that was afforded to it. Now, my impression last summer was that it did, in fact, raise a few eyebrows, this uh, case. On the particular facts of the case, that, the conclusion may well have been justified. But of course, there is a general consensus that it is contrary to public policy to be able to get retrospective planning permission for demolition only in a conservation area with no scheme for replacement. We turn then to the later case, Spitfire Bespoke Homes Limited and the Secretary of State. Now that was decided in the, at the end of April, um, just gone, so, so several weeks ago. As you can see from the slide, there was an attempt in that case to have the decision letter quashed on the basis that the inspector ought to have followed an approach said to be taken from Bohm. Now, the approach was as had been described, it was said, in the judgment of uh, Mrs Justice Leven, that when considering the impact of the proposal on the conservation area under Section 72, it's the impact of the entire proposal which is in issue. In other words, the decision maker not, must consider not merely the removal of the building, which made the cause positive contribution, but also the impact on the conservation area, conservation area of the building which replaced it. She must then make a judgment on the overall impact on the conservation area of the entire proposal before her. So that was said to be the approach, and that founded the criticism, which we're just going to come and see in a moment as we looked at the facts. Now, Spitfire, the case concerned Huntley Lodge in Leamington Spa Conservation Area, and the Huntley Lodge was said to have both positive effects, positive aspects to it, and also detracting elements to it in terms of the way in which it affected the conservation area as a whole. The Spitfire inspector treated the loss of the positive attributes of the building as harmful, and as that was less than substantial harm to a heritage asset, it was a factor which he weighed heavily in the balance. The inspector also made some detailed design criticisms. The proposed buildings would appear tall and bulky. They didn't um, follow one of the um, they didn't follow one of the prevailing design characteristics. The dormer windows were said uh, to be likely to detract from the current sense of space between the buildings. So, looked at the loss of the existing building as a harm and made detailed design criticisms of the replacement scheme. The claimant's approach in a nutshell was that the inspector had approached the decision, the claimant's claim was that he'd, he'd said that the harmful loss of the positive attributes of the building plus the harm of compassion. The court rejected the claimant's criticisms and what it said was a, an overly prescriptive approach and found that the inspector had in fact reached an overall judgment about the effect on the conservation area. But it was clear that the positive attributes of the existing building, which would be lost, counted against the grant of planning permission. So what's the link between these two cases, the Tower Hamlets case and the, the Spitfire case? Well, it, it may already be obvious to you, but to my mind, the link between the two cases is this. If inspectors are prepared to treat the prospect of a beneficial redevelopment as a significant factor in the balance, without all of the pesky details of the replacement scheme getting in the way, 
and as you've seen, detailed criticism really can matter, then there may be a perverse incentive in favour of taking a staged approach to securing consent within a conservation area. And I can explain the, ste I explain the steps there on the slide. Does it create a perverse incentive? Well, it may be more straightforward to secure planning permission for demolition, weighing harm against the benefit arising from the prospect of redevelopment without risking criticisms of a detailed scheme. And of course, the next stage would be to have the scheme assessed against a blank slate, a cleared site where there's likely to be pressure to get some replacement. Well, if that uh, is right, then, you, and you can see the strategy, well, what of it? Well, it, it is, of course, important, just going back to where we started, that the context is that it's a criminal offence to demolish a building within a conservation area without consent. And that is unlike other breaches of planning control, so there isn't the enforcement notice um, stage. Secondly, a staged approach for proposals may result in sites sitting vacant, and in a period of economic uncertainty, that becomes a more pressing issue. If it is undesirable for applications for planning permission for de demolition alone to be made, and instead redevelopment proposals should be considered at the same time, then government should say so. Well, that then rather begs the question, so what do we have in um, policy and guidance? Look for yourselves and, and, and judge it. But if you look at the National Planning Policy Framework at 201, well, that's obviously, uh, that is obviously setting out the way in which you deal with um, harm arising in a conservation area. Look at the PPG. The PPG2 is providing detailed guidance on the way in which you would categorise harm, and that's obviously of fundamental importance to the outcome. But what it's not dealing with is process. And so my argument would be that it is necessary for this to be made clearer. We turn then to prosecutions. And you may have seen, published uh, only in the last couple of weeks, um, the RTPI handbook, which was published, I think, with funding from MHCLG. It seems to me that it's a useful guide, for, particularly for those who are new to this area. And the knots that I've put on the slide there, they're from the handbook itself, let, lest you think I'm being sniffy about its content. I'm, I'm not. It says it's not legal advice. It says it's not a substitute in-depth report but in-depth research but it does provide um, a good overview of the area so within then prosecutions we're, lo we're looking at the proceeds of crime act and and i ask rhetorically well is is it a, a, an esoteric subject and m my answer to that is firmly no because for local authorities as i'll uh, illustrate in a moment with reference to a recent case it's a really important um aspect of what the local authority needs to be looking at in terms of prosecution and for those who are advising a developers responsible for heritage assets it's necessary to appreciate really quite the gravity of the risks arising from offences um, in this area and the case to illustrate those points is um, Owadali and Owadali was a case decided in the Court of Appeal Criminal Division in February just gone planning case prosecution by Southwark, three offences as you can see of breaches of enforcement notice contrary to section 179 and the breach of planning control as I've identified on the slide was the conversion of a single building to eight flats. Now the benefit arising from the offences was declared to be £400,000. Benefit is, a, uh, is an important concept within um, the Proceeds of Crime Act. It's a gross benefit, as I show you on the slide in a few moments. So here, for example, it was rent, not rent minus management costs, but rent. So that's quite important to appreciate. The available amount, the amount that can be paid by the defendant or defendants is 3.7 million pounds. And that was based upon equity in various properties. A cons uh, confiscation order, was made in the sum of 400,000 pounds. So you can see that that was the benefit arising from the offence. 
you will or may um, appreciate that there is a recovery incentivization scheme, ARIS, and that that applies to sums ordered to be payable under confiscation orders where the local authority is both investigator and prosecutor. And in those circumstances, the local authority will keep 37.5% um, of the order, confiscation order. Now, 37.5% of 400,000 is, uh, as a matter of fact, £150,000, but I don't know whether or not um, Southwark uh, kept any of that uh, um, order, and if so, how much. A note of caution to sound here, and an important one, it's not just uh, a plug for one of my cases, although it is that too, uh, it's actually really a really important issue. Financial benefit is not a reason to prosecute. In the Knightland Foundation, the fact that the local authority had um, been motivated by a, the, the prospect of a, of a Proceeds of Crime Act order was one of the matters upon which an abusive process argument was founded and the stay of the prosecution was ordered. So a, cr a critical issue in that case. The approach confirmed in the later case of Wokingham as well. The possibility of a Proceeds of Crime Act order being made in the prosecutor's favour should play no part in the determination of the evidential and public interest test within the Code for Crown Prosecutors, i.e. the test which must be applied at the outset and then throughout the process, um, the evidential and public interest test in relation to bringing and maintaining a prosecution. Cautionary note having been sounded, there is another reason why Oadali is useful. It's in that case, the Court of Appeal Criminal Division reviewed the authorities relating to fines and confiscation orders, and it summarised um, the effect of the authorities reviewed. It noted that each case is fact specific. It emphasised that the purposes of sentence in such cases are coercion to comply with the planning regulations, punishment, and deterrence. It uh, emphasised that an offender must, must not be permitted to profit from their offending. And finally, in setting the fine, the fine, the court should have regard to the level of confis the confiscation order and ensure that the fines are just and proportionate. Now that's interesting that way round because it's the court in the court looking at the fine will have regard to the confiscation order. So in other words, the confiscation order is what's setting the benefit and then the fine mustn't um, duplicate, that mustn't double count it. And that, had, that principle was taken from a case of Kohali, as I've, and I've put the reference on the slide here. The earlier case of Kohali made clear that although financial benefit is a matter to which the court's directed in 179, for example, in setting the fine, double counting was not permitted. And if the confiscation order has addressed that, it must not increase the amount of the fine. So it is just worth comparing fines and proceeds of crime act confiscation orders. Um, as those of you who um, have been involved um, on either side will know that there are no sentencing formal sentencing guidelines in place. When one looks at previous cases, they're highly fact sensitive. And the outcome of course, is that fine levels vary considerably from case to case. Confiscation orders on the other hand, the, the quantum of the confiscation order is calculated by reference to gross benefit, as I mentioned um, a few moments ago. There's a, a fairly recent case on that, but that's confirming um, some earlier case law, that's eventually a gross benefit, so expenses not deducted from that. And rather than have an ad hoc process, which sometimes happens particularly in the Magistrates Court in relation to the defendant's means, for proceeds of crime act confiscation orders, there's a formal statutory process for the assessment of the available amount, i.e. how much can be paid. And as you've seen, um, there's some retention by local authorities. So it seems to me that in straightened um, economic, in a straightened economic climate, and in circumstances in which a heritage asset can't be made pay for itself, and yet still requires funding to be looked after, Heritage enforcement may become um, an increasingly important issue, and of course, if that is right, then so too all of these detailed aspects, including the, its prosecution and the Proceeds of Crime Act and so on. So with, um, with all that in mind, um, I'm going to pass back to Suzanne. <laughs> 
Right, well, thanks right. everyone. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Melissa, for um, setting out for us uh, approaches to demolition and conservation areas and also uh, POCA fines and confiscation orders. I think we have had um, a couple of questions, which I think uh, Andrew and Craig have volunteered to answer. Um, the first one is a question from uh, Monica Ford, which is, um, are you able to expand on practice for defining the curtilage for a listed, for a listed building? And um, should the plan attached to the historic environment record um, be used for that purpose? So perhaps Craig, you can help on that, please. Um, <clears throat> yes, um, I think I can deal with that question at two levels, really. The, the first is to uh, say that the approach should be governed at the higher level of the legal, <coughs> um, to which I made reference um, in my presentation. And on one of the slides, you recall, um, I think it's on slide 15, the three factors from um, Lord Justice Stevenson's judgment, Stevenson factors, uh, but I've also um, emphasized the need to have regard to relevant considerations of relative size and um, ancillariness, um, although um, indicating um, uh, their status as matters of, of, of law, but they are relevant to consideration. Um, at the other level, I would, as a practical uh, way forward, look to the Historic England's guidance, but my recollection is that there isn't much of any detail about what uh, should be included. And so um, uh, I'm not sure that there's going to be um, significant help there. I think it would be possible to refer to the um, HER, and of course it might be very helpful insofar as it actually does show clearly what the curtilage is. Um, but it seems to me that the right question to be asking, dependent on the circumstances, is not so much, is not necessarily what is the curtilage, I must define it and show it on a map, but whether or not the objects and the structures about which I'm concerned are within the curtilage of the building in accordance with the law. And that's a rather different question, which might tactically be the right approach rather than doing it from the other way around. Thanks very much, Craig. Um, and Andrew, uh, Oliver Goodwin has asked a question. Um, I think basically what he wants to know is um, your view on whether there's an inconsistency between Mr. Justice Holgate's analysis and um, that of Lord Carnworth's analysis in Dill in relation to the treatment of objects and structures insofar as they're regarded as buildings. Do you have any comment to make on that? Yes, thank you. I should just also note that Ross Chambers, who's from Stratford-upon-Avon District Council, mm -hmm. which was the authority, as it were, on the wrong end of the uh, Dill decision, was. Um, vexed, shall we say, by my use of the word egregious. I think really it's Mr. Dill's position was egregious in the sense that uh, he was unable to argue a point having lost it um, on the Secretary of State's position several years beforehand when he didn't even even know about it. So to, to that extent, the, the, he was on the side of the angels there, perhaps. Um, dealing with with Oliver's question, I, mean, I think there are two two observations to make. The first is that in the Dill case, the, the structures, the items were, were very definitely not fixed to the land um, and applying the sort of law of real property issue uh, approach to that extended uh, definition that, that Lord Carnworth spoke of. It was very clear that they were two different things in the sense that you had a, the, the issue of uh, a fixment for real property purposes for the extended definition um, and then this, the, the issue of whether they were buildings in their own right, in which, course, in which case, of course, they would attract their own protection. So there were, Lord Carmouth was very clear in his judgment that there was a, disti there was a distinction. And so forensically, that there's no issue. However, that said, the second point perhaps to make is that, yes, perhaps there is um, 
attention and one can perhaps see the working through of that as I mentioned in my in my um, presentation where it's acknowledged in some of the cases on uh, the issue of whether something's a building the the, the Barvis case in particular where references made to the policy desirability of giving the local planning authority control over big things which have amenity effects. And it's not difficult to see how that approach would come to be read across with somebody arguing, well, look, in consideration of whether or not this should be a building and therefore a listed building, um, have regards to the fact that it would be desirable on policy grounds to bring this thing within the scope of listed building control. And whilst it perhaps can't be part of the extended jurisdiction because it's not in any way fixed so as to be within those authorities from the, the law of real property within the extended um, definition, it is worthy of protection. And please, by applying the definition of building, which includes these policy elements, ensure its protection. So to an extent, I think that there, there, there is something in Oliver's point um, but it doesn't spring directly from the approach in, in, in DIL and the statutory definition, but it perhaps comes from elements of the way in which the issue of whether or not something is a building will come to be approached now. We've, we've had one more question, which I will just ask, um, ask uh, Craig and Andrew to see if they can deal with, and this has been raised by Bridget, and that's whether or not um, the concept of setting is actually a better method or means to assess the value of an object and structure or structure rather than curtilage. Do you have any any view on on that? Well, I'm I'm happy to go first on on, on that, Susie. Um, uh, I, I don't think that um, that would necessarily help. Um, one is it would require a change of uh, the legislation because uh, curtilage is. Um, uh, fixed, at least at the moment, in the legislation. We therefore have to deal with it. Um, but the second, uh, second point is that certainly in my experience, I haven't felt um, that there are many cases where the concept of setting could be said to be so much easier than the concept of curtilage that I would say, oh, I'd much prefer to be talking about setting than curtilage. Um, sadly, both these uh, words uh, are sometimes difficult to um, grapple with, uh, depending upon circumstances. So, um, Susie, I, I, there's another question from Aaron Nelson, which I think yes. links with this, which is, has the term curtilage outlived its usefulness? It seemed, seems riddled with uncertainty. <laughs> well, uh, there are two, two answers to that. Is One is, no, it hasn't outlived its uh, usefulness, because sadly, for the same reason I've just given, we have to grapple with it. It is uh, firmly embedded in statute and we can't ignore it. We have to understand it and apply it. As to the uncertainties, I'm afraid they do continue, but it would be nice to think that um, the Hampshire case in the Court of Appeal is an opportunity, perhaps a yet further opportunity, to help give more clear guidance as to curtilage and the approach to take to that question. Yes, I, I, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I, I'd rather regarded um, Aaron's question as a bit more of a rhetorical stroke philosophical question as to whether or not the concept of curtilage was um, no longer useful. And I, I was actually going to propose that we end on, on that philosophical question for people to ponder um, as they see appropriate and to thank you for such excellent presentations and to thank everybody else um, for listening to them and unless anybody's got anything pressing that they'd like to say I was going to wrap it up at that at that point thank you all very much um, thanks thank very you. much everybody thank you bye-bye bye now